Welcome to Through the Bible with Les Felder, a 30-minute walk through the Scriptures, teaching in-depth Bible truths that change people's lives. Now, here's your host, Les Feldick. Okay, good to see everyone in again, and we're going to go right on into 1 Timothy chapter 4, and uh, this is our third program now this afternoon. I'm going to keep repeating it. We're now in book 45, we're in the middle four programs, and today this is the third program, and we've got one left. For those of you out on television, if you'd like the program that you've just watched, and you order or call in, just tell us, if you possibly can, the number up here on the board, and then we don't have to go back and try to find out what program you're talking about. And uh, all the past programs are available, so uh, for those of you who have just tuned in recently and you want to pick up on what we've taught earlier, you just call us and we'll send the information out to you. Again, we always like to remind our listening audience that we're just an informal, non-denominational Bible study. I'm not connected or hooked up with anybody. We are totally independent and uh, I'm responsible only to the Lord Himself for what we teach. All right, we're going to go right on now in 1 Timothy chapter 4, reminding again those of you who may be turning in for the first time or you've missed it, that these are the pastoral epistles. In other words, Paul is writing to these two men who will more or less pick up the mantle of keeping the churches in control. And uh, the whole purpose here is the function then of the local body of believers. You don't find salvation explicitly explained. You don't find uh, a lot of the other things that you'll find in Romans. In other words, our past as sinners and our need for salvation and so forth. But these are merely instructions to keep the local group of believers moving ahead. And uh, as I said in the last program, there's nothing in here to indicate the huge denominations that we've seen and all of their differences or the hierarchy. Uh, the apostolic church was relatively simple, just under the control of a group of men who were called elders and uh, then another group of men who more or less did the servitude work of the church, which were at that time called deacons. So now in chapter 4, Paul is going to do to Timothy as he did to us as ordinary believers throughout his other epistles, and that is warn against the false teaching that would be coming in. And you know, as you look back to the situation in Paul's day, how much false teaching was always attacking the church. It's a wonder Christianity survived. It's a wonder that we've been able to keep the Word of God. But of course, God is in control and, and He has kept it. And uh, here we are, almost 2,000 years later, and uh, we're still privileged to partake of this marvelous grace of God. But it's been under attack constantly. I don't believe there was ever a period in the last 2,000 years that the church wasn't under the attack of false teachings of one sort or another, and it's no different today. All right, chapter 4, verse 1. Now the Spirit, the Holy Spirit, <coughs> speaketh expressly. In other words, there's just no doubt about it, that in the latter times some shall depart from the faith. Now we call this apostasy. And if Ever, there had been a time in church history when we have seen rampant apostasy, it's today, where huge blocks of people, denominations and so forth, are rejecting the basic fundamentals. And that's apostasy. And so Paul was already warning of it before he even left the scene. All right, so the Spirit expressly says that in the latter times some shall depart from the faith giving heed to seducing spirits and doctrines of demons. That's quite a statement, isn't it? Now I'm going to take you back to 1 Corinthians. Come back with me, honey. I think 1 Corinthians chapter 11. 1 Corinthians chapter 11. Or 2 Corinthians. Wait a minute. It must be 2 Corinthians. Yeah, 2 Corinthians. Sorry. 2 Corinthians chapter 11. 
Dropping in at verse 13. And you want to remember that the Corinthian letter was written a few years previous to the letters to Timothy and Titus. But he says much the same thing. Only here he's writing to the individual believer, not just to the church leadership. Verse, or 2 Corinthians chapter 11, dropping in at verse 13. For such are false apostles, deceitful workers, transforming themselves into the apostles of Christ. Men who would usurp even apostolic authority, but they were harbingers of evil. They were false. And then verse 14, and no marvel. In other words, don't be surprised. For Satan himself is transformed into an angel of light. That's quite a shocking statement, isn't it? In other words, Satan can make his appearance and folk will think that this is God himself. That's what he loves to do, and we're to be aware of that. And especially in this day of such mass confusion. Now, I've never looked in on the Internet, even though we've got a web page, but from what I hear, you must be able to find anything up there that you can think of. The devil is using these final days to literally pull the plug and bring in mass confusion. Well, Paul was already confronted with it, certainly on a much smaller scale. Now then, verse 15, Therefore, since Satan can transform himself into an angel of light, therefore it is no great thing if his ministers, in other words, preachers, denominational leaders, evangelists, whatever, who are under Satan's control, they can too be transformed, see? as the ministers of righteousness. But they're not. They're ministers of evil. But they make the world think that they're it. Oh, they'll use Scripture. You know, I'm always telling people, especially if they call on the phone and I, I can be explicit, I say, now listen, I've never known a false teacher yet that didn't use probably 75 or 80 percent of truth. That's what makes it so deceptive. 80% of what they'll say, oh, it's just a, you know, a, a term. But I wouldn't disagree with it. But then in comes 20, 25% of absolute garbage that destroys the truth of the Word of God. And this is what we have to discern. This is why we have to know what the book says. Because they sound so good. Some of the big, fastest-growing cults today, why are they growing so fast? They sound good. They're moral. They're good people. But listen, their doctrine is nothing but a can of worms. But oh, they use enough scripture to make it sound good. And so Paul is warning even the Corinthians, it's no great thing if his, that is Satan's ministers, also be transformed as the minister of righteousness. And the gullible public swallows it. But their end shall be according to their works. In other words, their one day will stand before the great white throne and be pronounced their doom. All right, back to 1 Timothy chapter 4. And so these false teachers will be coming in and they're seducing spirits. In other words, they hook people. And they have nothing more than the doctrines of demons. Verse 2. Speaking lies in hypocrisy. Now, whenever I see the word hypocrisy, when it comes to biblical things, one man in Scripture always comes to my mind. Who was it? Who was the biggest hypocrite that scripture could ever tell us about? Huh? Judas! Judas! What a hypocrite! And he played it to the hilt for three years. He went along with Christ and his earthly ministry. He even carried the money bag. And it came all the way down to the night of the Last Supper and the Lord says that one of you are going to betray me. Did any of those fellows have an idea who it was? Not a one. Why not? He was the perfect hypocrite. He went along with everything, 
but in his heart he had no time for it. Lord only knows how much he embezzled out of the bag. The Bible doesn't tell us, but I have my right to ask. I'll bet he got a bunch of it because he was not part and parcel of the Lord's work. He was a total hypocrite. Well, listen, the world is full of them tonight. Oh, they look so good on the outside. They sound so good. They can, they can, they can somehow just cause the masses to come under their control. But listen, it's not the power of the Holy Spirit, it's the power of the evil spirit. It's Satan's domain. And the more they can bring in under the control, the more I'm reminded of the words of the Lord Jesus himself. Broad is the way that leadeth to destruction, and many there be that go in thereat. But narrow is the way, and few there be that find it. Never forget that. Only the small percentage are going to be in glory, not the masses. Now, I just read a poll again the other day that 75% of the people polled here in America thought they were going to go to heaven when they died. Well, bless their hearts. I, I hope some of them are, are right, but I know from Scripture that most of them aren't because it's not going to be that kind of a percentage that's going to have eternal life. It's the small remnant that God has always had had to keep for himself. All right, so here's the warning, just as plain as Scripture can make it, that they're speaking lies in hypocrisy, and it doesn't bother them. See, this is the first thing that people will ask me if they call, and I say, listen, run from that kind of stuff. Yeah, but less. They're using the Bible. They're using the Word of God. Now, what does it say? It doesn't bother them. They don't care because their own spiritual conscience has been seared to where all they're concerned about is their own welfare. They're not concerned about the multitudes they're leading to a devil's hell. Their conscience has been seared with a hot iron. Verse 3. Now, here we come to a part that just on the surface it's, it isn't shown, but uh, you get into some, some biblical history and so forth. What you're finding in this next verse came out of the Gnostics, Gnosticism. And they were a group of people in Paul's day who were operating in the local churches. And the word Gnosticism comes from the Greek word for knowledge. <clears throat> and those men thought that they had more knowledge. They felt superior to the main run of the believers in the church. And so they came up with the idea that they could dip back into ancient Hebrew practices, mix it with some of Paul's, and then they come up with their own concoctions for spirituality. Well, that's what exactly what Paul is referring to. So they came up with this idea of forbidding to marry, commanding to abstain from meats or various foods, which God, Paul says, has created to be received with thanksgiving of them who believe and know the truth. Now, of course, they were going back into the Jewish law, forbidding to eat the uh, unclean foods and so forth, and they were mixing it with some of the other things that they had pulled from Paul. They mixed a lot of times some of the philosophies from the Greek philosophers, and boy, they thought they had a pretty nice package that they could present to the people, and it was. It was something that just hooked them, see? All right, now then you come down to verse 6. If thou put the brethren in remembrance of these things, in other words, how the false teachers are coming in, and they're deceptive, they're hypocritical, but they don't really care about the end result for their listeners. They're just concerned about their own welfare. And so he says, put the fellow believers, remember now, he's talking to Timothy as a pastor or an overseer, put the brethren, the ordinary run of the believers, in remembrance of these things, and thou shalt be a good minister of Jesus Christ, nourished up in the words of faith and of what kind of doctrine? Good doctrine, that which... Timothy had received from the Apostle Paul, whereunto thou hast attained. And now remember, how long has Paul known young Timothy? 
Well, you see, Timothy was one of the first converts that he had up there in Asia Minor when he first started his missionary work amongst Gentiles. Timothy came from the area of Central Asia Minor, Derby or Lystra or something like that. And uh, Timothy was probably a young man, about 17 or 18 years old, when he was first saved, probably through Paul's ministry. All right, now, if Paul was around 40 when he began his ministry, and, and uh, one young Timothy at the age of 18, so just in round figures, you see, Timothy is about 20, 22 years younger than Paul. Now, for ease of remembering, I like to think of Paul as being born probably about the same time that Christ was, which was around 4 B.C. So by the time we get up here to uh, Timothy in about 60, 64 A.D., that's the age of the Apostle Paul. He's in his 60s. He's looking at 70. And then here is young Timothy now up to around 38 or 40, see? And so when he speaks of having trained and taught Timothy, indeed he has for 20 years. He's been his right-hand man. And so Timothy became then the logical one to pass these things over to. All right, so that's what he's making re reference to in verse 6, that you've been nourished up in the words of faith and of good doctrine, whereunto thou hast attained. Now then, coming down to verse 7, He's going to again warn young Timothy so that Timothy can warn the people out there in the churches. But, verse 7 says, Refuse profane and old wives' fables. Exercise thyself rather unto godliness. And then verse 8, here comes the Gnostics again. For bodily exercise profiteth little. Well, those who were teaching Gnosticism were, t were more or less trying to build an elite group of people that were probably excelled in physical things, they were excelled in uh, the philosophies and so forth, and then consequently, those were the people that thought that they really had it made. But Paul tells Timothy, bodily exercise profiteth, now the King James says profiteth little, but when you look at the Greek, what it really means is that bodily exercise only profits for a little while. Now that makes a lot more sense. We know that good bodily exercise profits. It helps us. But it's not going to help for eternity. It only helps for a little while in this life. And so that's what he's telling Timothy. He ain't telling Timothy, now don't exercise and, and just be a couch potato. No, he's not saying that. But he does say, don't follow this Gnosticism bit that exercise is more important than the things that are spiritual. All right, so bodily exercise, verse 8 again, profiteth only a little while. But, flip side, godliness is profitable unto all things. In other words, it's just going to permeate your lifestyle. Godliness is going to enhance the local community. It's going to enhance the nation. As what is it, Proverbs that says, Righteousness exalteth a nation? Of course it does. And so it comes all the way down to the individual believer. All right? And so godliness is profitable, having promise of the life that now is. In other words, we're not just living a pie in the sky, are we? We're living a life that is profitable in the here and now, but it's also profitable for that which is to come. Eternity. Eternity. Now you've got to realize the masses of people out here are living only for the three score and ten. That's all. And then it's all over. And they've got nothing more to look forward to but eternal doom. But for the believer, we have the abundant life here and now. As we've been seeing for the last several programs, we have this approach of prayer. We have the knowledge that God is with us every minute of our life. But hey, this is only just a smidgen of it. The best part is still to come. As I shared with my classes here in Oklahoma the other night, my goodness, take the best pleasure that you can think of. 
And when you get to eternity, it's going to be multiplied a million times. Maybe more than that. Beyond what we can comprehend. What God is preparing for us who believe. But it also enhances our here and now. We get the best of both, see? All right, now let's go on. Verse 9, this is a faithful saying and worthy of all acceptation. For therefore we both labor and suffer, or uh, we're going to receive reproach, and we're going to receive all the fiery darts of the ungodly community around us, simply because we trust in the living God, who is the Savior of all men. Does that mean everybody going to go to heaven? No. The next statement qualifies it. Who will? Those that believe. Now, you know what that verse is saying? What I've been teaching on this for the last 10 years. When Christ died, he paid the price of redemption for how many? Everybody. When Christ forgave the sins of the world, how many people did he forgive? Everybody. I really shook somebody up. They, they called here a while back. And he said, I never thought of it before that even Adolf Hitler could have received eternal life if he'd have believed. Adolf Hitler was already forgiven. Adolf Hitler was already reconciled in God's eyes. But what did he have to do to appropriate it? Believe. And as far as we know, he never did. But see, this is graphic. We can't comprehend that. That when Christ died, he paid the sin debt for every human being who ever has lived or ever will. He forgave that sin that he died for. He has made it possible for reconciliation to every human being. But what do they have to do to cash in on it? Believe it. Now that's not easy believism. That is simply a genuine, heartfelt, faith-prompted belief. That yes, Christ died for me and rose from the dead, and I believe it with all my heart. That's all it takes. And then, of course, God moves in, and we move on from there, and we begin a life of service. We begin a life, yes, of good works, if you want to call it that. But oh, Paul makes it so plain, see, that God is the Savior. In other words, he's already done everything that needs to be done not just for you and I who believe, but for the whole human race. It's all done. But it isn't appropriated until man believes it. And isn't it amazing that they can walk it underfoot? I can't comprehend it. How can people just spurn such a prospect? It's just beyond human comprehension. And yet, it's the way it's always been. You know, I always remind people when I say, listen, the way is narrow and few there be that find it. There were probably four or five billion people on the earth at the time of the flood. How many were saved? Eight. That's getting awfully narrow. Just eight. And then you go on up a little further in biblical history and you got Elijah confronting the prophets of Baal. And Elijah thought he was the only one. And God says, oh, no, Elijah, you're not the only one. I've got 7,000. And I've told my classes over and over, what percentage was 7,000 in Israel? One-tenth of one percent. That's all. One-tenth of one percent. The rest had followed Baal. And it's no different today. Yeah, I'll stick my neck out. I think it's closer to one-tenth of one percent than it is ten percent. Because the vast majority of humankind has no time for the gospel. And of even those who are involved in some kind of a Christian activity, how much truth are they getting? I don't know, but I'm just saying God has always had that small percentage who truly believe. All right, verse 11, these things command and teach. And now verse 12. Let no man despise thy youth. Reminds me of Nyris and I got on a plane here in Tulsa one day a while back, and uh, she couldn't find our seat number, and as we were going down the aisle, uh, I finally saw our seat number, and there were two young guys, each sitting on the aisle seat. 
And they looked to me like about 25 or 30, you know, and I said, honey, there it is, right by those two kids. <laughs> and the guy smiled, and he says, hey, thanks. He said, that's the best compliment we've heard in a whole long time. They were brothers. He said, but we're 40 years old. <laughs> well, you see, when you get as old as we are, 40 is pretty much like a youth, you know. And I imagine that's how Paul felt about Timothy. Boy, at 40, Timothy was still in the prime of life. He was a youth, see? But remember, when he first met him, he was 18 or 20. But whatever. He said, let no man despise thy youth. But be thou an example of the believers, see? Even Timothy was to be a constant encouragement to those fellow pagans who had come out of it and had now become believers. All right, so be an example of the believers in word, in conversation, in love, and in spirit, and in faith and purity. Now, here again, you remember I told you several times, once when we were back in 1 Corinthians 13, again when we started 1 Timothy, I said, how many times Paul refers to the last three things in 1 Corinthians 13? Now abideth these three, faith, hope, and love. Well, here you got two of them again for about the second time in the last couple chapters, see? And so he says, keep it up in love, in spirit, and in faith, and in purity. Now, he doesn't mention hope here, but he does in other places. All right, verse 13. Until I come. In other words, remember, Paul has now come out of his first prison experience, and he is probably going to meet Timothy at Ephesus, I'm thinking. And as he goes from Rome across the Adriatic Sea and probably crossed over northern Greece, I think maybe he stopped at Philippi and then dropped down to Ephesus where he hoped to meet Timothy. From Ephesus, he's going to go on down to the island of Crete where he will meet up with Titus. And uh, then from Crete, of course, he comes on back and uh, finally ends up again in Rome and arrested for the second time. But anyway, so he says to Timothy, until I come, give attendance to reading, in other words, to study, to exhortation, and to what? Doctrine. Doctrine. Don't ever, ever put down the need for doctrine. In other words, what do you really believe? What does the Word of God teach you? This you're supposed to know beyond a shadow of a doubt. Thank you for watching Through the Bible with Les Felding. Through the Bible is a partner-supported ministry. If this program has been a help to your study of the Scriptures, and you'd like to see others enjoy the teaching, your support would be greatly appreciated. Write to us at Les Feldig Ministries, Route 1, Box 760, Kenta, Oklahoma, 74552, or call 1-800-369-7856. Remember, all programs are available in printed form, audio cassette, and videotape. Be sure to tune in next time to Through the Bible with Les Feldick.